We are continuing in our series, uh, Learning the Way. And through this, we've been looking at the life and the teachings of Jesus, and we've been doing it by going sequentially through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we've been following Jesus' teaching from beginning to end in each one, uh, getting an understanding of the spiritual journey that Jesus brought the disciples along. Uh, we're currently in Matthew, and what we're looking at is how, uh, as the disciples committed to Jesus as a teacher, they came into a deeper and deeper understanding of who he is, that he is the Son of God. Uh, they also came into closer and closer relationship with him. And as they learned from him, he gave them more and more a part in his ministry, in his own work. So when the disciples committed to Jesus, they committed to a new life. A new life that involved making God's will their will and growing in their commitment to joining with God in all areas of life as they walked more and more closely with Jesus. So last week we saw how Jesus moved the disciples into a new phase of ministry uh, where they had been learning from him. They had been seeing what he was doing and how he did it. They had been helping him uh, in the work that he was doing of preaching and teaching and uh, performing miracles. And then he moved them on into doing this work themselves. He sent them out on a missionary journey. And today we're going to see uh, how Jesus, as he's speaking to both John's disciples and to some people who are gathered around uh, while uh, his guys are out performing miracles and ministering in the surrounding area, we're going to see how Jesus spoke to the responses that his work was receiving as well as the response of those who truly receive and follow God. So as we turn to uh, God's Word this morning, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> Holy Spirit, thank you that you are God, that you alone are holy, that you alone are God. Thank you that we can know you, that you've given us your word, that you've given us your son, and that you've given us your spirit. And as we continue in worship through the study of your word, spirit, please guide us into understanding. Uh, please bring us not only into knowledge, but bring us into a true knowledge of who you are. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 11. If you have your Bible, you can open there, and if you don't have a Bible with you, the white book in the seat pocket in front of you is what you're looking for, and on page 822, you'll find Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> so, as we come to the reading this morning, uh, I'd like to go over a little bit of background information that helps us all get up to speed as far as where we are coming into uh, the scripture today. And... For those who've been with us over the last several weeks, you've seen that Jesus began preaching the good news of the kingdom. In line with this, he's been performing all kinds of miracles, from healing every kind of sickness and disease, to driving out evil spirits, to calming the wind and the waves, and even raising the dead back to life. He's called the first disciples, and he shared not only his life with them, but his ministry as well. He shared new truth. Not truth that's new, but truth that was new to them. He helped them understand the scriptures, to understand what it meant for them in their lives, and how to apply it. And he's been teaching them why he's here. He's been teaching them what he's doing and why he's doing it. And he's asked them to share in his work alongside him. Now, just ahead of where we'll pick up today, Jesus has sent them out to do all the same things that he's been doing. And he's told them to expect nothing different for themselves than they've seen happening with him. There should be no different response they get than the ones he's received. And so, as we come into the reading this morning, the disciples are out doing Jesus' work, and Jesus is back uh, in Galilee, actually in Capernaum. Uh, and he's 
continuing in that work himself. So as we begin with Matthew 11, verse 1, it says, When Jesus had finished giving orders to his twelve disciples, he moved on from there to teach and preach in their towns. When Jesus, or when John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent the message by his disciples and asked Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, those with skin diseases are healed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And if anyone is not offended because of me, he's blessed. As these men went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes. Look, those who wear soft clothes are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And far more than a prophet, this is the one it is written about. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare the way before you. I assure you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, and the violent have been seizing it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. If you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Anyone who has ears should listen. Now, to what then should I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to each other. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but you didn't mourn. For John did not come eating or drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Then Jesus proceeded to denounce the towns where most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes long ago. But I tell you, it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until today. But I tell you, it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure. All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. <clears throat> All right. So what's happened here? What's going on? Uh, in the section of scripture that we read where John has sent his disciples to ask Jesus this question and Jesus has responded to the crowds and said all these things to them. You know, Jesus, as we're told at the beginning, has sent his disciples out uh, into the towns of Galilee to do the same kinds of things that he was doing. He gave them orders to teach and to preach in the towns and along with this to identify and call new disciples. He gave them all of the authority that he has, as we read last week, to perform all the same miracles that he was doing. 
And while they're out doing these things, Jesus is continuing to do them as well. John the Baptist, who's in prison at this time, is confused by Jesus' ministry. He's confused by Jesus' activities. John thought that Jesus would be doing some very different things than teaching the disciples and performing miracles of healing. So John sends some of his disciples to Jesus with a question. And the question is there in verse 3, and it's basically this. Are you the Messiah, or is there going to be someone else? And Jesus' answer, in a nutshell, is yes, I am the one. The lame walk, the blind see, good news is preached to the poor. The scriptures are being fulfilled before your very eyes. Of course, I'm the one. Though you're obviously having trouble seeing it, I'm obviously the Messiah. Which is the main point here, and it's this. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the chosen one of God who was promised from the beginning. He's the one who would deal with the problem of sin by bringing God's judgment against it. He's the one who fulfills all of God's word. After the first instance of sin, when Adam and Eve turned from God in the garden, he promised to send someone who would set things right by destroying sin, by destroying the corruption that comes from choosing our own way instead of God's way, by destroying all evil, all wickedness, all selfishness, everything that's not good and perfect and holy like God is good and perfect and holy. <clears throat> the law and the prophets all spoke of the one to come, the one who would bring God's justice and would bring God's judgment. Jesus is this one. In him, the scriptures are being fulfilled, but it's just not happening in the way the people who had God's word expected that it would. You see, the Jewish people of Jesus' day had some ideas about the Messiah. And these were largely based on various psalms and sections of the prophets, like uh, Psalm 2 and Psalm 21, and uh, Psalm of Solomon 17 and Daniel 7, and all of these places in Scripture that talk about a perfect, holy warrior anointed by the Lord who will overthrow all the kings and kingdoms of the earth. These passages show this person brought before God and given all the authority of heaven to rule over all the powers and all the peoples of this world. And they tell how this person will come as a child, born among men, carrying all the names of God, that he will be Emmanuel, God with us, that he will reestablish the throne of David forevermore. Now, some of the people in Jesus' day were looking for a literal military commander with the full power of God behind him who was going to defeat the Romans and drive them out of Israel. Others were looking for a spiritual leader who would perform mighty acts of judgment against the corrupt religious leaders of their day and would return the nation of Israel to truly serving God, who would return the temple of God in Jerusalem to true worship. Now, it's not like <clears throat> these understandings of the Messiah are wrong. They're just limited. They're not complete. They're based on portions of the scripture, but not the whole. So they need to be filled in, and this is what Jesus does as he responds to John's disciples. So let's take a look at that. What does Jesus tell John's disciples? Well, he doesn't tell them that John is wrong or even that he's off base. Jesus simply appeals to more of God's word than they have in mind. To show them how what he's doing, to show them how his activities are the activities of the Messiah. So Jesus tells them, guys, there's more to the picture than you've got in view. If you're only looking for mighty acts of judgment, then you're not seeing all of who I am. You see, John had been out in the wilderness. He'd been called by God to preach a message of judgment and a message of repentance. He'd been talking about the coming of the Messiah and the judgment that the Messiah would bring. John called the people to turn back to God before it was too late. 
He expected Jesus to confront and humble the corrupt religious and political leaders of Israel. He may have even expected Jesus to walk right into Jerusalem calling down fire from heaven. So Jesus' teaching of the disciples and his work among the poor and downtrodden, his miracles of healing, they confused John. John just doesn't get how what Jesus is doing are the actions of God's <clears throat> holy Messiah, God's purveyor of divine judgment. So Jesus responds to John's disciples within the context of the prophet Isaiah to help them see the complete picture. In verses 4 and 5, Jesus quotes from Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61 to round out their understanding. And he basically tells them, well, doesn't Isaiah say that when the Messiah comes, the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. That good news will be brought to the poor and the brokenhearted will be healed. Guys, don't you see that God's word is clearly fulfilled in all of these things that I'm doing? You just have to broaden your vision. You have to understand more of the scripture to see it. And you should also know that Isaiah talks about the Messiah in the same way you're thinking. In chapter 7 and 9, he says, Behold, the virgin will be with child. She will have a son. He will judge the kings of the earth. He will break the rod of oppression and conquer every enemy. It's not one or the other, though. It's both. And it's not happening the way you think because it's not happening in the order you expect. You know, God doesn't do anything different than his word says. But sometimes his people don't get it because they don't fully grasp his word. And sometimes they have limited expectations for God based on what they do grasp. It's not like John only knew Isaiah 9 and 7 and didn't know 35 and 61 as well. It's not like he didn't also know chapter 53, which says, My chosen servant will take up your infirmities and carry your diseases, that he will be pierced for your transgressions, and by his wounds he will be healed. John just wasn't connecting all of this stuff together, and he needed some help to do it. So he went to Jesus. You know, and it's okay. It's okay to not get the full picture. It's okay to not understand everything all at one time. At least John was humble enough to ask. You know, there's no problem in not understanding. There's no problem in asking questions. We all are limited in one way or another. None of us is God. None of us understands completely everything. We're all human, and John was no different. But God wants us to ask our questions. He wants us to go to him for the answers. He wants us to seek him in his word and to learn from him, to be responsive to his spirit. And John, even as a prophet, a messenger called by God to speak God's word to God's people, was still growing. And this was no reason for condemnation. In fact, it was reason for praise, as we see when John addresses the bystanders who seen this whole interchange. So let's look at that. What does Jesus tell the people, right? After he speaks with John's disciples, what does he tell the people? <clears throat> you know, all these people gathered around, they were there to hear Jesus preach and teach. And they just heard Jesus exchange with John's disciples. Jesus knows they might think, hey, maybe there's some rift here between John and Jesus. Or they might wonder if this means that John is somehow less of a prophet because he had to be corrected in his understanding. Mm -hmm. So Jesus speaks to this right away, showing both his respect for John and praising him as a true messenger of God. Let's look at verses 7 through 10. <clears throat> 
As John's disciples went away, Jesus began speaking to the crowds about him, saying, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? No, of course not. That's not why you went out there. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft or fine clothing? <clears throat> no, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. So what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and far more than a prophet. This is the one whom it's written about. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before me. What Jesus is actually quoting here in verse 10 is Malachi 3.1. Malachi was the last of the prophets to speak for God until John came. There were approximately 400 years of silence between Malachi's time and John the Baptist. And Malachi, just as Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the other prophets told, how God would send someone ahead of the Messiah to announce him. And the person they name is Elijah. Now Malachi does this in, ver in chapter 4, verse 5, where he says, I am going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And here in verse, verses 11 and 14, Jesus affirms that John is not only a true prophet, but he is the one who fulfills the role of Elijah. He's the one who is sent to prepare the way. And Jesus says, I assure you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. John is a true prophet, and there's been none greater. That's what Jesus is saying. He's fulfilling the role of Elijah. He is the one who has been sent to prepare the way for the Messiah. So if you can accept this truth that John is the Elijah, then you have to accept something else also. That I am the Messiah. That I am the one who brings the great and terrible day of the Lord. You see, Jesus is pointing out how the scriptures are being fulfilled and how what John has been prophesying is true. Now, it was normal for people in Jesus' day to be skeptical of a prophet because there have always been true, false, true prophets and false prophets. But God, through his word, has given his people three tests for this. Three tests for not only prophets, but prophecy. Does a prophecy come true? You know, is it fulfilled? That's test number one. Deuteronomy 18, 21 through 22 speaks about this. Test number two. Does the prophecy correspond with God's revealed word? Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3 speaks about that. And is the prophet living a God-fearing life? Uh, Jeremiah 23, 9 through 18 talks about that. All three tests are necessary to confirm prophecy. It's not one of the three, it's all three of them. And it doesn't just have to do with the prophecy, it has to do with the prophet himself. Is the prophet living a God-fearing life? Do they, does what they say correspond with God's revealed word? And does what they say come true? Mm -hmm. Jesus is confirming to the people not only that John's message is the genuine, genuine article, but John himself is too. And all the law and the prophets, as Jesus says, have testified about what's to come. That's all of God's word. It's all true, and John is the real deal. So if you're willing to accept the truth about who John is, then you should be willing to accept the truth about who I am. But not everybody's ready to take that whole package. As Jesus points out, the one who doesn't fall away based on this is blessed. And you know, not only is John the genuine article, but Jesus is saying, my disciples are too. And those who follow me are doing actually even greater work than he is. 
which is what Jesus means at the end of verse 11 when he says, though John is the greatest of prophets, or John is the greatest born among women, even he who is least in the kingdom is greater than John. Why is that? How are Jesus' disciples greater than John? Well, John is a messenger announcing the king. John is a messenger announcing the one who brings the kingdom. The disciples, however, are being let in on the king's plans. The disciples are being trained for the king's work. Like Jesus tells them in John 15, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends because a servant doesn't know his master's business. The disciples are being trained in the master's business, and John has only been pointing the way to the trainer. But that doesn't make him any less of a partner in the kingdom. It doesn't make him any less of a partner in God's work, which Jesus points out next in verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, and the violent have been seizing it by force. In other words, the powers of the world are hostile to God's advancement. And those who are truly joined in his work are suffering opposition. They're being come against. This is why John's imprisoned. It's why the tide of opposition is turning against Jesus and his followers. The true work of God always comes against opposition in this world and many times finds rejection even among God's own people. This is because many of those who claim to be God's people lack maturity and wisdom. They lack the vision to be able to see what God himself is actually doing. They think they have knowledge and they think they can see, but they don't actually see any differently than the children of this world do. And Jesus illustrates this in verse, verses 16 and 17 by likening these people to children in the marketplace who can't be pleased no matter what tune is played. And then he follows that in verses 18 and 19 with the parallel to how John has been received and how Jesus himself has been received. And though their ministries are completely different, neither one of them seems to be acceptable. John came neither eating nor drinking. He came fasting and preaching judgment, guys. And they say he's got a demon. The son of man, I came both eating and drinking. And they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of sinners and tax collectors. No matter what we've done, no matter who we've gone to or what we've said, you just aren't happy. You're just not pleased. Both of us are doing the true work of God, but it doesn't fit what you want. So you reject us both. <clears throat> But as Jesus points out at the end of verse 19, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Wisdom is proven by what she does. And wisdom is a very common Jewish name for the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of God is proven by his actions, and my actions as well as John's are very obviously his which is why in verses 20 through 24, Jesus names these three towns where he's been working most heavily and he denounces them. <clears throat> Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum were all clustered together at the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus had set up his base of operations in Capernaum, and most of his miracles had been performed there in that city as well as the two uh, neighboring ones of Bethsaida and Chorazin. So when we read about all the sick and all the demon-possessed being brought to Jesus, the places where that's happening are those three towns. Despite all of his healings, despite all of these obvious miracles, all this obvious work of God, those towns didn't repent. And Jesus tells them basically, you're more blind than, the, than even the notoriously wicked cities of old who came under God's judgment. Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom, they were the epitome of hard-hearted God-rejectors. But even these towns, had these things been done among those people, 
would have seen what you're not seeing. You're rejecting me because you're rejecting God's spirit. You're rejecting his wisdom because you're blinded by your own. And your rejection is placing you under judgment. The judgment I'm here to take for you, but you won't open your eyes to see who I am. And you know, this is where most of the Jews got hung up, because they expected the Messiah to bring this great and terrible day of the Lord. And they expected for that day to be great and terrible. If I see obvious acts of judgment, then I'm going to fall down on my face and repent before God. They thought the Messiah, if the Messiah were here, it should be frightening. God is a holy God. There should be all kinds of divine judgment all over the place. That's not what we're seeing, so he must not be here. How is this humble teacher, even with his amazing miracles, the frightening and terrifying purveyor of God's holy justice? Well, because he is God's justice, and he is God's judgment. He's judging wickedness and evil, and he's doing it within himself. Mm -hmm. His judgment is consuming all these things with his holy fire. His judgment is consuming all of these things and totally destroying them by taking all of those things within his person mm -hmm. and dealing with them there, destroying them for all time by defeating them on the cross. As Colossians 1, 15 through 20 says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, because by him everything was created in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. For he is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross. Because of God's holiness, he's taken terrible judgment upon himself. He's come to us and taken what separates us from him so that we can come together with him. Mm -hmm. He's brought healing and he's done this in Jesus. There will be a great and terrible day of the Lord still coming for those who reject what God has done. But there's already been a great and terrible day in Jesus. <coughs> And through what God has done, not only on the cross, but by coming to us in Jesus, we can come to him. Which comes right to the heart of what Jesus is saying as we come to the end. is <coughs> this. Coming to me brings you to God. Coming to Jesus brings you to God. All who come to God do so through Jesus. Whether they've come before Jesus' earthly life or after, he's the lamb who was slain before the foundation or the creation of the world, the one whose hands formed the earth, whose hands were nailed to the cross, and in whose hand we rest if we trust in him. But to come to God, you have to accept his work. You have to accept the work of his spirit, and this is wisdom. This is what Jesus is saying in verses 25 through 30, when he points out that wisdom is hidden from the wise and actually is revealed to infants. Those who lean on knowledge without also leaning on God are blind. They're trusting in what they know, not trusting in the one who has made everything known. But those who will become like infants, who will drop their preconceptions, they find true wisdom. And true wisdom leads to truly knowing God. Being able to see the Son, who will show you the Father. But to do this, you have to come to Him. You have to respond to His call. And this is wisdom. This is responding to the Holy Spirit. And the call of Jesus, the call of his spirit, is the call to discipleship. 
to come to him, to take his yoke and to learn from him. To learn from the one who is gentle and humble in heart and who reconciles all things together in himself. He does this by coming to us and asking us to come to him. He calls for a committed relationship, for intentionally spending time together and doing it for expressed purposes. And through this, his disciples truly learn who he is. They learn who they are and they grow to be more like their teacher by growing closer to him in relationship. They actually come to know him in a real way. To take his yoke is to intentionally take his path and learn from him. In Jesus' day, a yoke was something that both eased a heavy burden and it was how you pitch two animals together to pull a plow or to pull a cart. To take Jesus' yoke is to agree to stick your neck in it with him. You know, immature animals were trained by being yoked to mature ones. The mature one pulled the plow straight and responded to the commands of the driver. And the immature animal was trained to go in the right way by being yoked to a mature animal who would do the right things. This is a discipling relationship. And it's no different today than it was then. It's no different today than when Jesus asked his disciples to come to him and take his yoke and learn from him. Those newer on the path need to learn from those who are further on the path. Those who are beginning to follow Jesus need to learn from someone who's already been following Jesus and says, come along with me as I follow him. And to do that, it requires recognizing that you have to commit yourself to a teacher. That you have to lay down time for them and make the relationship with them a priority, just as they are doing for you. As they come to you, you come to them. Your burden is eased in this way, not because you don't have to carry it, but because you have someone to help you with it. And it's not that you won't have struggles, but you'll have help navigating them with someone who is helping and already navigating their own, just like you are, within the one who is gentle and humble of heart and who gives rest. The one who has already overcome all of these struggles that you face. And is it any surprise that God's plan for reconciliation is committed relationship. God calls for mutual commitment in all areas of life and all relationships. Husbands are to be committed to wives and wives are to be committed to their husbands. Parents are to be committed to their children and the children are to be committed to their parents. Bosses are to be committed to their workers and workers are to be committed to their bosses. And you name it. The Bible is full of examples time and time and time again of mutual commitment. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands as they follow Christ. Parents, love your children and discipline them. But children, or children obey your parents, but parents don't exasperate your children, right? Workers work as though the Lord's eye is on you, whether your boss's eye is on you or not. And bosses treat the workers like the brothers and sisters that they are in Christ. By committing to one another, we get to know each other and grow together. By prioritizing these relationships, we make the right decisions in them. You know, you don't really know anyone who you're not committed to. And if you don't prioritize them, you don't really love them. Love is making things a priority even when you don't want to. It's doing stuff that you don't like because it's needed and it's what's right. And to love anyone the right way 
you have to love God the right way. And this means committing to him. <coughs> the commitment that he calls for is the commitment of a disciple. Come to me, take my yoke, and learn from me. To become gentle and humble of heart. By not only coming to, but by committing to and coming to know the one who is. So the question we all have to ask ourselves if we're following Jesus is, have I committed to him? Have I committed to him as a disciple? That's correct.